Once again, welcome to Treatment Talks, Treating Peristomal Hernias, a treatment talk from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. Peristomal hernias are a common problem for about 50% of patients that have a stoma after a radical cystectomy. A peristomal hernia is when intestines protrude through the abdominal wall at the side of the stoma. My name is Morgan Stout, and I'm the Outreach and Education Manager here at the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. Today, I am joined by Dr. Benjamin Palos from the Ohio State University and patient advocate Daryl from Chicago. Welcome. First, Dr. Polos will talk about peristomal hernia, what it is and how it's treated. And then I will hand it over to Daryl to talk about the lived experience of having a peristomal hernia. So with that, Dr. Polos, I will hand it over to you. Hi, thanks everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, chat with you this evening and I'm looking forward to a very robust discussion and uh, it should be a really fun one. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Thanks again. And as Morgan mentioned, um, I'm one of the faculty here at Ohio State and uh, my practice is largely in hernias and also specifically peristomal hernias. And these are some of my disclosures. I do receive salary support from our Quality Collaborative, which collects data around hernias in general. And I also receive research support from the following institutions. And I also have a startup company listed there that's unrelated to the content I'm talking about here. A little bit about myself. Um, so I actually was born in Southern India in a very tropical climate. Um, and uh, it was a beautiful area. My parents uh, left for the opportunities here in the United States and we moved to Brooklyn, New York. And from there, uh, my parents followed the jobs and we ended up from Brooklyn, New York in Leavenworth, Kansas, which is where I grew up. So I definitely grew up in the Midwest, um, went to school as an undergraduate at UNC Chapel Hill. And then I did my medical school at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Uh, left there and did my surgical training at Vanderbilt University. Uh, went to Ohio for my specialization in minimal invasive surgery and abdominal wall reconstruction back to Vanderbilt as faculty for 10 years there. And I founded the Vanderbilt Hernia Center. And then apparently all roads lead back to Ohio. So back to Ohio for a job and I've been here at Ohio State now for the past four years and it's been a ton of fun. So you would think that we would have the ability to take a hole in the anterior abdominal wall or core musculature and close it maybe with some type of mesh and people do okay. Well, it gets complicated because even that simple process can be uh, very, very challenging to keep that hole closed over time. It gets even more complicated when you have to have a controlled hole, if you will, when you have an ostomy of any sort, be it your urostomy, a colostomy, or an ileostomy, where you have to keep that hole just wide enough to allow it to pass through, not too big and not too small. So these are the topics I'm going to cover today. What is a peristomal hernia? Why do they happen? How do we treat peristomal hernias? and also have some uh, discussion time at the end to chat. I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. So what is a peristomal hernia? Um, so as mentioned, a, a stoma itself is kind of a controlled hernia where you have to have a, a hole in the abdominal core musculature to allow the ostomy to pass through. What a peristomal hernia is, alongside that hole, uh, you have something else passing through. And typically it's a piece of small intestine or even colon that can pass through and get stuck in between the abdominal wall and also where the ostomy is. And this can lead to several symptoms. Sometimes it can be completely asymptomatic uh, and not have any symptoms associated with it. Other times you can have pain, uh, even blockages uh, from it that can result in uh, some serious consequences potentially. So looking at ostomies um, overall, about uh, just under half a million ostomies are created in the US alone with the mean age there. Uh, and if you look at the different type of stomas that you can have, colostomies really are the majority, but also ileostomies and urostomies uh, are, are fairly common as well. So some facts about ostomies, oftentimes they're uh, intention intended to be frequent temporary uh, type of things, but however, over 40 to 60% of ostomies actually are never reversed and they're there for life. Ostomies in general are created to improve quality of life, oftentimes with a life due to a life-saving cancer operation that can result in an ostomy, basically diverting either food or urine away from where the, uh, uh, the, the cancer was. Stoma complications, including parasoma hernia, certainly can reduce quality of life. And that's something we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about here. 
So how often do these occur, peristomal hernias? Um, in one study, uh, this was done at a, a colorectal hospital in England, 203 end colostomies and 150 endoleostomies were evaluated over a long time. And if you look at over this time frame, ostomies formed anywhere from 16 to 30, 37% of the time. And it's probably higher, higher than this. Um, a very famous colorectal surgeon, uh, Dr. Gathright, once mentioned, if you have an ostomy long enough, you have a 100% risk of peristomal hernia. Well, why is this? Um, and we think we're just beginning to kind of understand why this is the case. If you think about the torso, um, not necessarily as <clears throat> how we traditionally think about the abdomen with organs inside it, but more as a functional unit of the core muscles where there's a pelvic floor, the back and the diaphragm, and of course, the anterior abdominal wall. If you have a hole in the anterior abdominal wall, either a hernia or an ostomy, which again is a controlled hernia, um, it's a natural weakness that can lead to hernias forming around the uh, bowel where the stoma is. So it gets complicated as mentioned also because um, as a field, we think that uh, physicians and surgeons have really underestimated the complexity of the anterior abdominal wall. And it, it becomes hard because especially when you think about why ostomies are created to treat cancers, I mean, that's complex enough. Uh, and for other reasons, let alone trying to think about how to prevent a hernia from forming. But we do know it, it's very similarly complex uh, just to treat these hernias and sometimes even more complex to prevent these hernias from happening in the first place. And I um, hate to bring this up, this may bring up some um, PTSD from high school or even college in terms of physics. Um, we can't escape physics. Uh, there are two laws that are at play here, Laplace's law, which describes wall tension um, across a cylinder, uh, and also Pascal's principle, which tells us that fluid, uh, a force of flow, uh, applied in a fluid system is uh, then applied to every area in that fluid system. Those two concepts are really critical because um, our trunk or our core muscles is basically a big cylinder that uh, um, has to obey those laws. And so um, there's a baseline pressure inside our abdominal cavities that is constantly pushing things out. And you can imagine if there's a hole anywhere in that cylinder or the core, um, it's a natural weak spot that allows things to protrude through. Now, repairing that core muscles, those core muscles, be it with the hernia repair or other means, we are learning that um, you can actually stabilize the abdominal core and uh, treat those hernias. Ostomies, though, you can't completely stabilize the abdominal core musculature for that main reason, as we mentioned, that it's kind of a controlled hernia with a natural weak spot there. And this is why we think that um, hernias form at some point in the course of ostomies uh, over the course of having the ostomy for years. So what causes peristomal hernias? Certainly there are some risk factors, including increase in age, obesity, steroid use, sometimes technical errors when you create the ostomy can lead to hernias forming. And we also think that tobacco use may play, may, uh, play a role in it from a wound healing standpoint, although that's not very well thought to be contributing to the hernias forming in the first place. The biggest factor really is it just happens. Um, you, for the reasons I mentioned in terms of that interplay between pressures and core muscles and you have a controlled hernia, um, it just happens over time because we live our life and we have a baseline pressure in our abdominal cavity that tends to push things out through holes there. So um, how and why do we treat peristomal hernias? I'm gonna go a little bit over non-operative management, which is really key uh, for managing symptoms associated with peristomal hernia. We'll talk a little bit about surgery. Non-operative management is really, really important. And this is really important because if you think about what I just said and what the information I presented that if you wait long enough, you're gonna have a hernia associated with uh, um, uh, an ostomy. Well, if that's true then, you have to think um, you have to have an ability to manage yourself as a patient over time um, with, unfortunately, uh, some component of a hernia. Now, a lot of times they don't cause any symptoms. And so then you wouldn't think, uh, you would think that the threshold of recommending repair uh, would not be met because if it doesn't cause many symptoms, although you have a hernia, although it's not an ideal situation, it's somewhat of a control situation that most people learn how to live with. And these are the uh, mainstays of learning how to live with a peristomal hernia. Certainly local skin care is really important, um, especially if you're having difficulty uh, placing a pouch over the ostomy because of the hernia itself. 
you of course want to minimize spillage, leakage, um, and uh, you can sometimes use different types of adhesives and different barriers uh, to help manage that. Belts, braces, and trusses can help to some degree. Uh, the only problem with this is sometimes it's very difficult to fit something that adequately um, holds enough pressure to kind of keep the hernia at bay, if you will. And I added mindfulness here, not so much to kind of be cute about it. It's really an important point because if you're coming to me or another uh, abdominal core specialist <clears throat> with a, a peristomal hernia, oftentimes our recommendation, especially at the early onset of it, if it's not causing a lot of symptoms, is just to wait uh, and, you know, deal with some of the issues that uh, you may face with having a peristomal hernia. And the reason why this is important is because we're trying to stretch out as much time as possible between doing surgery, knowing that even after you repair it, there's a very, very high chance of it coming back. And this sometimes becomes a mind game, especially if, you're, if you've had a history of cancer, because one thing that I found is that, you know, most of us um, who have uh, problems like that, and most of you who've had cancers treated, you know, you're very much in the mindset of, well, we want to take care of things right now <clears throat> and, you know, attack these cancers and attack these peristomal hernias and fix them. And uh, sometimes that's a little bit difficult to apply to these peristomal hernias. So it's really a change in mindset uh, that's different than what a lot of folks are used to dealing with. And that's important because I think, um, some acceptance of having the peristomal hernia and knowing it's not going to be fixed for a while is, is an important way to manage these hernias themselves. I think one thing that's really key is finding a knowledgeable and dedicated ostomy nurse because they have a number of tricks available to them to making your life uh, easier to live with the peristomal hernia um, that can oftentimes end up having the peristomal hernia for years and not necessarily having surgery. This is a patient of mine um, who had a cystectomy about three years ago, presented to me with a peristomal hernia, you can see there. <clears throat> and uh, he tried to use an abdominal binder to a reasonable degree and, and used the binder for about three years. And then the hernia just kept protruding more and more to the point where the binder was not very helpful. He was having a lot of pain from the peristomal hernia. And more importantly, um, he and our, 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 myself and the urologist thought that the, the hernia itself was causing some obstruction of his urinary tract, causing him to have some decreased uh, renal function. And so I'll tell you his outcome uh, later on in the talk. And we went ahead and repaired it for those reasons. And I think that's an important example of uh, the threshold we would use for deciding to recommend surgery or not. So peristomal hernia repair, um, again, it's, it's a very common surgical disease and wide variation of care is obtained I'm going to change my talk here for one second. Here we go. And so our goal with peristomal hernia repair is to take this uh, hernia here itself that's adjacent to the bowel coming through the ostomy and fix it and either put a piece of mesh below it <clears throat> or a piece of mesh on top of it and then have things heal up and you should be okay. So when should you consider this kind of surgery? Um, as mentioned before, when you have severe pain, uh, when you have blockage of fluid coming from the ostomy, uh, and as mentioned for urostomy, this can cause a decrease in renal function. Uh, and also when you have extensive leakage that cannot be controlled by any recommendations that uh, our ostomy nurses have, and especially if you're having leakage uh, on a daily basis that's just making your life miserable, <clears throat> those would be uh, pretty clear indications to go ahead and do the repair. Um, in extreme situations, um, also, we recommend repair. This is a patient who had an ileostomy and um, actually had an, uh, a peristomal hernia, but also had a prolapse of the ileostomy. The bowel was just kind of pushing through the middle there, uh, leading to a very uh, unstable and difficult situation for which we performed a repair. So if you look at the common types of peristomal hernia repair, um, they really break down into three different categories. Uh, one is what's called a local open repair, where we make an incision somewhere around the stoma itself. Um, we do know that if you don't use mesh, there's a very high chance of early recurrence of these uh, ostomy hernias. If you use mesh, it does decrease the chance of recurrence, um, and it does vary the uh, time to recurrence, which is often very, very variable. The uh, laparoscopic repair, uh, and also it's now done robotically, can reduce wound complications. It does afford you a wider choice of mesh materials. 
The uh, problem with the laparoscopic or even a robotic repair is that um, we can only tend to place the uh, mesh inside the abdominal cavity. And that has some consequences for later on trying to repair a recurrence of the hernia or other surgery you might have. Abdominal wall reconstruction <clears throat> um, is a more complex, technically difficult operation where um, we would do very complex maneuvers to the muscle and the uh, uh, what are called the fascial coverings of the muscle around where the hernia is. And sometimes we may actually recommend moving the, her moving the uh, uh, ostomy to a different spot to then start with a fresh site. And that is an advantage of this more formal and extensive abdominal wall reconstruction. Sometimes we can even place a prophylactic mesh at the new site to help um, extend the time without having a hernia at that site. However, it is a complex operation to perform, and this should only be used after initial local efforts at repairs have failed. And certainly, unfortunately, you can still get a new peristomal hernia uh, at the, the new site there as well. So why don't we know more about hernias after cancer surgery? Um, and this is an important point to make, especially for um, groups like yours. Um, unfortunately, there's very little dollars, federal funding dollars, that go towards hernia research and prevention. And if you think about this, it kind of makes sense at face value. If you have to choose between curing cancer and fixing hernias, I think most people would agree that curing cancer is probably more important. Um, where it becomes a little more complicated, complicated is after we cure the cancer and now you have a hernia impacting your quality of life and your cancer survivorship, um, we do need some additional information to help us figure out what to do. Um, obviously, we need both. We need investments both in curing cancer, but also in making sure your life as a cancer-free patient um, is, is of high quality. And you're not dealing with a lot of consequences from oftentimes uh, a curative resection of cancer, but now that's impacting your quality of life. We did a study uh, a few years back looking at cancer survivorship, and we just wanted to see what's the chance of developing any kind of hernia in your, in your core muscles after having life-saving cancer surgery uh, for an intra-abdominal cancer. Well, if you look at the information we found, it was actually fascinating. Um, in this graph, we show different operations on the left and on the bottom, you see the percentage of the study population that developed a hernia. Um, the, uh, the yellow uh, bars show the, the percentage of patients with the hernia for each one of those operations. And what we found is that overall, uh, amazingly enough, 41%, uh, just less than half developed a hernia within two years of their life-saving cancer operation. Specifically to this group, after cystectomy, it was even higher than that. About 45% of patients <clears throat> within two years developed some type, some type of hernia. Most of these were, in fact, peristomal hernias. So the other kind of uh, compelling discussion that's uh, increased in uh, its focus is, um, what about at the time of the creation of the ostomy? Can you help uh, reduce the chance of the hernia forming for instance, by placing mesh prophylactically in the area to reinforce that. Um, we are finding that there is some information to show us that this actually may have some benefit uh, <clears throat> in at least delaying the uh, formation of peristomal hernias, um, but it's very, very in its early stages. Uh, and one of the trade-offs is now you have to place, you know, you're using mesh at the time of an, an initial operation, which has its own consequences. But our initial results are that it does have some advantage. However, the jury's not quite out yet on the effectiveness of this. So in summary, we've gone over what a peristomal hernia is. Um, we talked a little bit about why they happen, specifically in terms of this pressure uh, in, the, in the core muscles there. And we talked a little bit also about treating peristomals, uh, learning that the non-operative management uh, with local skin care it, uh, measures uh, binders, hernia belts, and finding a really experienced and uh, invested ostomy nurse really can um, extend the time uh, of having a peristomal hernia, but not so much where it impacts your quality of life negatively. And then, of course, we'll transition now to uh, talking about uh, our patient experiences. Uh, I want to hear from you in terms of your thoughts and um, some further discussion about this particular topic. So to wrap up, uh, this patient actually did really well, the one I was mentioning to you, and uh, we were able to fix his peristomal hernia, and uh, he did really well, and so he's been doing well for about a year and a half now. Um, so we can get good outcomes, but you just got to be careful when you finally decide to uh, fix these and repair these her hernias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Polos. That was incredibly informative.